Right now, I can't get a job. My last job was on the internet at Aura TV because the only...
Hello, and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. So the American presidency is the most powerful megaphone on earth. There is no better proof than the way Donald Trump plugged us into that insurrection. So now that Trump is gone, inshallah, how is Joe Biden using that megaphone? Not well. Not well at all. The art of leadership is having the right message at the right moment. A leader can control the message, but not the moment. Those don't come when you expect, right? So what has Joe Biden been discussing this week as the moment called for a powerful message on climate change? Well, vaccines, of course, the global economy, China, cooperation with our allies. And oh, yes, that cooperation surely includes action on climate. Hardly the clear, unequivocal call to build the public expectations and support that will be needed for the major steps that must be taken. Now, we all know I have a tendency to be critical of Joe Biden. So let me rush to say I am far from the only one on this frigid Friday who thinks that the new president is missing the moment. The Economist magazine, they like to call themselves a newspaper, is hardly some radical left publication. No, this isn't Jacobin or The Nation. But here they are, stressing how the crisis in Texas is the moment to press ahead on a plan to strengthen and decarbonize electric power, which could cut carbon emissions in half, or as they put it, get rid of carbon and blackouts at the same time. So why isn't President Biden saying that right now? Well, a well-run White House does, does not do anything by accident. This low-key approach to the collapse of the power grid in Texas was a decision. How do I know this? Because the White House showed it. The USA Today story here shows they understand what is happening and have the message. But instead of having those words come from the President of the United States, they invited reporters to a conference call with someone named Liz Sherwood Randall. She is a White House advisor on Homeland Security. She sounds pretty smart from the interview. She put all the pieces together that the power system, not just in Texas, but across the country, is not prepared for the extreme weather events that will become more and more frequent as climate change continues. And that we need a plan to rebuild the grid, dare I say, build it back better, so it can withstand these events and be part of the solution to climate change. In other words, as The Economist said, get rid of carbon and blackouts at the same time. But a conference call on a Thursday afternoon with a White House advisor no one knows about just isn't the same as an address to the nation by the president, either in Texas showing the world what's happening or at the White House or even Vice President Kamala Harris could do it. Biden could have made this a teachable moment and he still could. So why isn't he? Now, in fairness, and you know I am nothing if not fair, even to Ted Cruz, but I, I want to make a special statement about President Biden. Joe Biden's first 100 days deserve an asterisk. Impe impeachment, impeachment squashed his first couple of weeks. He deserves a refund for that. This was, truth be told, this was his first real week to speak to the country, clear of impeachment and the American carnage of Donald Trump. And as a first week, it was not as auspicious as I would have liked. We need Joe Biden to do better because we need climate action to succeed. There is no choice. Oh, and one last point. I want to reach out to Ted Cruz to show my fairness even to him. I love poodles. My own poodle, Bijou and I, are just horrified that your poor poodle was home alone in a freezing cold house as a reporter found. We know you're busy and on the road a lot. So, you know, well, we're wherever. So we want to extend an offer. Send Snowflake to us. We might change her name, maybe. But we have a home with a family and heat and plenty of dog food. So we have a great show today. Uh, it is Femme Friday. Simone Baptiste is back with Hadass Theater. And right after this break, we will be joined by one of America's top labor leaders, our favorite, Sarah Nelson. She is here with more on Joe Biden, the $15 minimum wage, and working people in the pandemic. We will be right back right after this break.
Hello. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. All right, guys. Um, you may know we have this book club. We are on the second month of the Nomi Key Show book club. There are three options. You can go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show and sign up for one book a month, two books a month, or if you're as as I am, four books a month. It is a uh, you know, this was a New Year's resolution for me <laughs> to read four books a month. And so far, so good. I don't know how I'm doing it, but I am. Uh, we have already featured this month Josh Fox's The Truth Has Changed. It was part of his one-man show that he did around the country. Uh, it was about how truthiness has infected America and how it's uh, infused itself into different industries to squash truth. Uh, through the PR campaigns of big agencies, oil and gas agencies, but also uh, in politics, as we saw post 9-11. And he takes us on a journey in the book, which is a reflection of his one-man show that is now also coming out as a film. Uh, in this book, he talks about how the 9-11, uh, his time you know, on the scene after 9-11, and into the Iraq war, and of course, uh, later when he was fighting off the fracking industry, how misinformation campaigns were used and got more sophisticated over time. And then later at the end of the book, uh, he, he reflects on 2016. And I think given our experience with the insurrection and seeing how misinformation and disinformation is spread and propaganda is spread, this is just the perfect book for the moment. We also did a great podcast on it. So go check it out. Go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. And if you're not already a patron, you can go become one there as well because that's how we pay the bills. That's how we buy these fancy microphones. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but that's that's how we do it. And we've had a great series of books so far. Harvey K uh, was what our big book in January. And we just set up a partnership with Verso Books and Haymarket Books. So you will be seeing our book schedule in the coming days. We will be right back. Sarah Nelson is going to be here with us today. She is the president of the American Flight Attendance Workers, part of CWA. She is, I believe, one of the most powerful and important labor leaders we've had in generations. She is the future of labor, and we are so grateful to have her on the show today. So we'll be back very shortly. Yay! Hi. <laughs> Had a little internet problem there. All good, all good. We're good. Okay. All right, mics are hot. Just heads up. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. It is always a pleasure. Just a joy to have Sarah Nelson join us. She is the president of the Associ Association of Flight Attendants. It is a CWA, AFL, CIO union and a tongue twister. Uh, she, <laughs> she has been a flight attendant since 1996, which is very impressive. She represents nearly 50,000 flight attendants in 20 different airlines. Is that correct? Is that an updated number? Uh, so we've lost a few airlines during coronavirus. We're down to 17, yeah. Ay, 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 ay. All right. Well, then let's just kick off with that. What is the state of of the flight industry? Attendance, airlines, everything. <laughs> well, what is the state of the industry? Uh, you know, demand is still down below 50 percent of what it was before coronavirus started. I mean, we're, we're coming up on a year now. Right. We started canceling routes and flights last January in January 2020. And actually, wow. you know, what's, uh, this is a really important point. And this is um, not just in our industry, but every industry. Um, as we know, uh, companies have really pushed workers to be more productive and the American workers more productive than any other country in the world. That's not necessarily something to be proud of. Uh, remember that little strike for bread and roses? Yeah, we kind of left the roses in the dust there. So um, <laughs> we actually, uh, the airline industry, much like any other industry, was running on overtime hours. And even when you have a union, and we're 80% organized in the airline industry, but when those flights started getting cut in January of 2020, 
that was a direct hit to the workers. Okay. So the, we, we lost a ton of hours. We no longer had those overtime hours. Some workers starting as early as January, 2020 started to take a 25 to 40% cut in pay. Uh, so when we got the CARES Act uh, provision, the payroll support program, which is the only workers first program in all of coronavirus relief and kept us in our jobs and our paychecks going, that was at a minimum. So a lot of people don't even talk about that, but workers took the brunt of this virus even before losing jobs. When the bailout happened, I remember this um, viral moment. I think it was on CNBC and there was this like billionaire CEO guy who went against his own class. And and I think you know which video, I wish we had it uh, handy. I just thought of it, but he he called out the industry saying, you know, the 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 CEOs of these airlines, the leadership does not they don't need the bailout and it wasn't going to the workers. Can you explain that dynamic a little bit more for for folks who may not have been on, on top of it? Sure. Well, I actually um, wrote a response op ed to that and challenged him and helped him understand that while the principal was right, he didn't understand what we did in the airline industry. Uh, because the program that we put together said that the money could only go to the workers. It had to go only to workers paying benefits, no layoffs, no cuts to hourly rates of pay. And we capped executive compensation for two years after the relief period wow. ends and banned stock buybacks. So we absolutely turned on its head what is normally seen as a corporate bailout. And uh, it's, it's, it's been really successful. But we had that power to get the airline industry to agree with us because Uh, We had control. Democrats had control of the House. We had uh, someone who's not just labor friendly, but really understands this stuff and has been around and was around through 9-11, Peter DeFazio, Chairman Peter Mm -hmm. DeFazio of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. And he said to the CEOs when they came to him, I'm not talking to you another minute about what the airlines need until you talk to the workers. You got to talk to them first. And they said, well, who do you mean? He said, you need to talk to Sarah Nelson. So we had a negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> we we had a negotiations outside of the legislative process. This is like one night where we said, "Listen, this is how it's going to go." And I told him, I said, "Look, the public hates you. We went through these bankruptcies and these mergers, and the seat sizes are smaller. You're squeezing people in together, and you have all these fees, and every, nobody wants to give the airlines any money." But if we target this for the workers and make this about keeping people in their jobs and frankly, keeping our economy going, because what that meant was that every aviation worker could continue to pay rent, pay their cable bill, take care of their families, continued contributions to Social Security, pension plans Mm -hmm. and retirement. I mean, this is this is long term effects here that we uh, shored up and made sure that wouldn't be falling apart, unlike our unemployment system that um, it doesn't even work in many states. Yeah. And so anyway, we got them to agree to that. And then we went, this is what people have to understand is that when you have unions in the workplace, you not only have power at the bargaining table, but when you can negotiate something in your workplace, that management, that those corporate executives actually want other companies to have to pay the same thing. Hmm. So you bring the power of capital hmm. to your negotiations politically as well. And that's what we did in this case. We worked actually hand in hand with the industry after we had gotten them, we had beaten them into submission and said, listen, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get any raises. You're not going to get any bonuses. And that is going to last after this relief period. And we're going to stop with these stock buybacks and dividends. This is not going to be a giveaway to the shareholders or a funneling to Wall Street. This is only about keeping workers short up and making sure that we don't bear the brunt of this pandemic. How much pushback was there? What were the dynamics you had to overcome? If you're if you're able to talk about it publicly, of course. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, some of this, as you know, you know, sometimes you don't talk about things because when you can give people credit and they can have a little save face, sometimes that's the way to get deals done. Um, so sure, I, I, I don't I don't tell everything. But what I can tell you is that we had a whole list of things on our agenda. We got the core pieces that we wanted. But one of the items that we had on the table was just neutrality mm. in union organizing. And they what actually, does that mean? What does <laughs> so that mean it folks? means yeah. what it means, actually, so what this means, this is part of the PRO Act, part of the labor rights bill that is being proposed and has been passed by the House and uh, now reintroduced. And hopefully we can move this forward part of this. This is about corporations just staying out of it, 
just mm-hmm. staying out of their workers' decision about whether or not to form a union. And actually, in our industry, under the Railway Labor Act, that already is in the law. It's hmm. just that there's not an enforcement mechanism. So we see uh, anti-union tactics and we see uh, corporations spend millions and millions of dollars on union busting. In fact, the last election we had at Delta Airlines in a six-month period, the company spent, um, at least what we know of, $38 million on busting the union. <laughs> that would have been, you know, if they had given that to the employees or, or put that into bargaining for the employees, think about how much better those lives could be. So anyway, they did not want to agree to simply staying out of it, simply allowing their employees um, to decide whether or not they want to organize. And they fought against that harder than they fought against us capping their pay <laughs> and keeping them from getting bonuses. You know, everyone's watching um, the Amazon fight right now in Bellamer, and I think it's been it's been an, an, I, the, the reports that have come out seeing how Amazon has so aggressively uh, busted, tried to bust this union, um, the yeah. right for them to vote and organize. Um, I mean, it's affected the shareholders. Shareholders are now coming forward, at least from from the UK and the EU and some even in, in the States saying, like, knock it off, let them organize like you don't have to be so aggressive. Um, so I think for the first time, a lot of people are seeing like what it actually looks like and hearing the details. Can you talk a little bit about what the Delta deal, like what kind of, what does it mean to bust a union? I mean, where do you spend that money? Like, how does that, how is that put to use? Yeah. So, um, a, a lot of ways. So, um, making employees come to forced meetings where they have to listen to anti-union rhetoric, um, having supervisors go through and call people at their homes. And, you know, when do you get a call from your supervisor at home? Usually when you're in trouble, right? Um, they had to, uh, during, during the voting period, there were, um, Delta only buses that would take them from the employee parking lot. So all the other, all the other, uh, airline employees, would share one bus to go to the airport from the employee parking area. But no, Delta has its own, where it would be papered with all this anti-union rhetoric. So they had to go go through that. Then they uh, get up to the airport. They go through hallways where there's more of it, too. And then they've got to sign in on the computers at work. And on the computer, before they could actually sign in and confirm that they were there for work. And remember, they don't have any due process here or anything, so they're terrified that you know, if the one time this, this late check-in for work, that could be the time that they're fired uh, without any recourse, right? So, so they're trying to check in for work and they have to watch an anti-union video before they can actually check in. And then as soon as the anti-union video is over, then it says, have you voted yet? If not, click here on a company computer. So what are they thinking? The company knows how I'm voting, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's that kind of stuff, sending uh, discs to everybody's homes, um, buying discs, of- every- discs. So like a CD at the time, it was a CD that you, or a, a, a DVD that you would put in and watch anti-union uh, <laughs> propaganda at home. Um, and they would um, hire more supervisors. They would hire people out of the unit to have more supervisors there so that they could have more conversations with people. Um, they would also they would also do things like say, we're going to give you a raise, but if the unions voted in, we're going to take it away. Now that's illegal. We would have fought that, but they say things like that. And we'll just be on top of people all the time, uh, every, every second. So it, at Amazon, that's exactly what's going on. You go to the bathroom, you see it. <laughs> you know, if you can even get to the bathroom, we've heard the stories about you got to walk all the way across a warehouse. Mm-hmm. It might take 10 minutes to walk over there and back in your docks if you don't go to the bathroom fast enough. Um, they've got the city coming out and changing the the, the traffic, traffic lights. lights. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Yeah. So this is a lot of power. Corporations have a lot of power um, where they reside. And um, for Delta is a great example. They're in Atlanta and Delta and Coke run the town and they're on each other's boards and, um, you know, extremely anti-union. And then we'll put a lot of pressure on the politicians to to either be anti-union or to stay out of it. Other community leaders, um, they'll do a lot of contributions like they'll, you know, they'll give big contributions to uh, MLK Day <laughs> and, the, and the parade and have big Delta banners or put a uh, Black Lives like, Matter uh, it, it, sign exactly, in front of their headquarters. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and um, you know, but then not actually want to give their workers any say or have any stability. And, and so 
Um, yeah, so th that's what union busting looks like. And they will hire union busting consultants. This is a big business. Billions of dollars go into this every single year in America. And that's why we're hearing outside of America, this is like, you know, this is foreign, foreign yeah. Yeah. Um, to most other countries. They, they can't believe that they wouldn't just let their workers have a voice at work. And actually, a lot of people understand that when you have workers engaged in the company through their unions, you actually have safer workplaces. Oftentimes, you can get to better solutions because people on the front lines are going to see exactly how something's going to work or not. And where we've forced ourselves in, and we have done that in the airline industry, you know, we're really engaged in all the safety aspects and we're at the table, but that's because of our union density. And that's just not right. the case in most industries. So that was actually where my next question was, what, how is your union density related to other industries or just in um, spaces where there's unionization? Yeah. So, you know, the private sector workforce is down to just 6% in this country. And so we're at 80% in the airline industry. That's a, that's a big difference, right? Um, and uh, public sector right around between 10 and 12%. Um, that's just, you know, that's not enough to make an impact. Uh, in, the, in the 40s, when we started to see, and, and early 50s, when we started to see union density move up around uh, between 35 and 40%, you, you saw all kinds, everybody from every party courting unions. And uh, I remember this flyer from 1954 with the, it was uh, Republican, uh, young Republicans celebrating labor, yeah. you know, waving the, the union banner. And um, now it's just assumed that any Republican is going to be anti-union. But actually, I want to challenge that a little bit, too, hmm. because we get so tuned into which party we identify with. And really what we need to be identifying with is the issues that matter to us as working people and uh, that we have so much more in common than anything that divides us. And where we have high union density in congressional districts, we have we have congressional House members who are Republicans who vote 100 percent of the time right. with labor rights and with unions. So it is it is not impossible and it's not necessarily keyed to one party or the other. It's really just about working people's power and how we build that. Yeah, you see that in, in New York. I mean, there are only a couple of of uh, <laughs> of Republicans, at least in the, the state legislature and the city council uh, in New York City, but they tend to support unions and it's. Um, can also be problematic too. <laughs> it's harder to well, get them out, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. So, yeah. Um, but you know what? We need to bring, that's why we have to understand that the union hall is the place where you bring not only economic issues, but also social issues. And um, this is the place, it's the one place where it's not a self-selecting organization. And you can have people from all different backgrounds and perspectives. And guess what? You can, you can actually moderate a discussion where people who may have never thought how someone else lives gets to hear that mm -hmm. because they have a common interest of making their jobs better, making their work lives better. And in doing that, they have to actually stand up for each other. There's got to be that, that solidarity in place. And you don't, you don't move forward with pushing the boss unless you have at least a 90% strike vote. So we're not talking about, you know, majority rules here at 51%. We're, we're talking about real consensus among the entire workforce when you build that power in the workplace to make change. Um, so it's the best place to talk about social issues too. Um, because it's directly related to power in the workplace. And it's where we're going to get people to think about other people's lives and other people's experiences in a way that they're not going to get anywhere else. Hmm. Um, can we talk a little bit about how Joe Biden, uh, the president, has been handling labor? I mean, he, he was Scranton Joe. He ran on a, a probably, I think you've, you've uh, praised his rhetoric around uh, issues related to labor, uh, yeah. the National Labor Relations Board uh, yeah. is going to have some reforms, but what was what would your score be today? Like, or what what has he accomplished? What does he need to work on? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'm still even a month, know. so let's <laughs> <laughs> firing Peter Robb uh, yeah, 23 good. minutes after he became president is pretty good. Uh, reversing all of the anti-union federal executive orders that were in place on day one, uh, he did that. Uh, he continues to talk about that. I also get reports back about what's happening in the Oval Office and the meetings that are taking place there, both with mayors and governors and also with other members of Congress. And, uh, you know, when the cameras are off, 
and hmm. there's no journalist there reporting and no labor union president there watching. He has said to these leaders, listen, you have to understand something. And he's pointed down at his chair and gestured to the White House and said, this is labor's house. And what he means by that is this is, you know, this is this is labor's house. This Hmm. this is where the people reside. But also he is putting uh, central to his policy workers rights now. That is awesome. Okay, we have the best rhetoric that we've had from a president in 100 years and we have to make the most of that. And what I what I will say is that Joe Biden doesn't necessarily understand all the work that's done today or all the work that we have done, for example, in our union as flight attendants to promote the value of the work that is traditionally done by women. Um, But, you know, his his ears are open and he's inviting people to the table to help him on those things that he doesn't necessarily understand. But what he does understand is that labor creates all the value in this country. And if we're not focusing on working people, Democrats are not going to get elected. He's not going to have a Congress that is going to help push his initiatives. Um, And he's putting that forward. He's putting that forward with the way that he is moving uh, the coronavirus relief package. Um, I would say that it, it could be even more. But what I know is that he worked on it behind the scenes to make sure that we got that 900 plus billion dollars done in December, even with Trump still in office. I think if we hadn't done that and we had gone off the cliff and 12 million more people would have been pushed mm-hmm. into poverty and the hole that we'd be digging out of right now if he hadn't gotten engaged. So I think he understands also that um, as you lift people up uh, there, they are more likely to feel that they are connected to the people that have been elected. And it's more likely that people then are going to get more engaged uh, because, you know, if everyone truly voted in this country, there, there would never, we would always have progressive ideas moving forward, right? We would always be, uh, we would always have those front and center. The problem is, is that when someone is poor, they are working two and three jobs to try to survive or just trying to, trying to survive the day. Right. And so how do you get to the polling place? How do you even think that your issues are on the ballot? You don't, you don't hear them. So as you pull more and more people out of that place of desperation and get people more help, they're more freed up to be engaged and they see the results. And it's more likely then that they get involved uh, in civics and and, you know, and have some connection to it, because I think um, the biggest problem that we have had over the past uh, several years is why does it matter? And what's really Mm. the difference between Republicans and Democrats? I have a couple more questions if you have some time. Um, just in relation to the gig economy, I, I, I know it doesn't uh. necessarily relate. Okay. So uh, this is one frustration I have with the Biden administration is that um, while he has been rhetorically very strong on labor and he's done some really critical things as you just laid out, I I personally feel there's um, there's just like a, a maybe behind the scenes war going on between the the folks who kind of come out of the Uber Lyft spaces, the gig economy yeah. spaces, Airbnb, whether it's yeah. uh, being lobbyists or lawyers or whatever that are literally in the administration and they were on the economic, yeah. uh, you know, the, the transition team. So yeah. ha- have you heard anything about just the tension there and, and who's winning? <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, without naming names. <laughs> Uh, I'll do that later. Don't worry. Okay, great, great, awesome. Um, no, let me just say that I'm actually also fairly excited about the fact that there's a greater foothold of people who are trained on real people who are mm-hmm. in working the economic space inside the White House, and um, you know they're they're, they're not they're they're it's not wall to wall with people yeah. like that, um, but but some of the worst actors have been pushed out. Um, and uh, some of the people who are more prone to uh, have been more prone to believing uh, in the idea of trickle down economics. And, you know, if you just fix the structure, everybody's going to all a rising tide lifts all boats. No bullshit. You know, that hasn't worked at all. And actually, we've left whole communities behind uh, by doing that. There's no equity in that. So um, I'm actually impressed uh, with the number of people that Biden is having around him in the economic space. Um, that are pushing on that and pushing really hard inside the White House. And like I said, that they're, you know, they're uh, they're not wall, wall to wall, 
but those voices are there and some of some of the worst actors have been pushed out and and have and and they're not welcome back so um so that is good news too but you know (laughs) he's still um Joe Biden is the guy who's still talking about bipartisanship, right? And yes. still talking about, um, you know, um, bringing everyone to the table and trying to win over Republicans. And um, I, the, the one thing I'm impressed with is that he's, he's actually been saying that that means mayors and governors. It doesn't necessarily mean senators, right? So, th- so that's good. But, um, you know, bringing all these voices to the table and looking at something like Uber and Lyft and some of these other uh, gig economy companies um, that also gets celebrated as innovation sometimes. Yeah. And um, so it gets lifted up and, and those people get a real voice. And unless we get the unions in there and we get working people in there challenging that, um, that's just not going to change. So, you know, Joe Biden is proposing that all of those people be identified as actual employees so they have a right to join a union. So at least he's providing that framework, but he's not going to do it for us. You know, right. we're going to have to push him every step of the way. And the one thing I, I, I can't say enough about Ron Klain, actually. I think it's tremendous that he picked Ron Klain as his chief of staff. And Ron Klain has been out there publicly. Uh, I know privately, too, but publicly saying, yeah, challenge us. You know, uh, challenge us when when we're wrong. This is how we're going to be better. Um, And that was not necessarily the approach with past administrations. You know, if you were going to be like hanging a flag from the top of a skyscraper, you were like, you know, talk to the hand. You're, you're, You're not getting in at the at the table. But but no, I mean, this administration is doing a lot more to reach out to people and also not taking it personally when when people are challenging them. And that's a, that's, I, a, that's a great point. Not taking it personally. Important. Yeah. You know, I, I tweeted something out yesterday and I did get a little bit of and it was our opening today, a barrage of of tweets from people saying, you know, how dare you say this to Biden? You know, it's only been a month and he has all these crises and. Um, and it was, it was essentially about how he needs to show up right now, uh, with this climate disaster in Houston, he should literally go to Houston, I believe. And they were like, well, no, it's going to distract everybody. That's, they said the same thing about Trump. They said the same thing about, uh, Bush during Katrina. So there's an, uh, there's a dynamic often about, um, the green new deal and climate reforms, uh, and the tension between unions. And I know that this may or may not relate to your industry as directly, but, can you kind of explore some of this? I mean, I feel like he's frozen right now, um, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's – I'm horrified that it's – we're on, what, day four or five of <sighs> Houston being frozen. And they have sent supplies, but they've said nothing. They haven't get issued – they haven't – from the Oval Office, uh, Kamala Harris hasn't said anything. I mean, they're – yeah, I, it, th- there is a deafening silence there. And um, uh, obviously Texas has isolated themselves and we're seeing the, um, the, the benefits of individualism right now, right? And um, so, <laughs> obviously saying that sarcastically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've got something like 10,000 members in Texas right now. And uh, a lot of them, haven't had heat for days. And my brother actually lives outside Dallas and he's got intermittent electricity. And uh, luckily he's an anthropology professor who lived in Nepal for years and years and knows what it means to boil water so that it's safe to drink. But, um, but you know, people, um, they, they can't leave. They can't get on the, out on the roads. There's, there's, there's nowhere to go. They're stuck in their homes that are getting increasingly cold. And um, they can't watch your show either because they don't have power. Um, but no, I mean, this is a moment where we need to we need to really shine the light on what's wrong here, and how the dismantling of government and the dismantling of um, our connection with each other um, and the way that we shore each other up and the dismantling of infrastructure, not investing, not investing in people. Um, the whole idea. I mean, as you know, I've got behind my behind me here the deficit myth always uh, <laughs> stephanie kelton's great know, book <laughs> this is this has been about pitting people against each other to believe that there's only so much pie and the truth is that the federal government is the issuer of the currency and we can invest it's a political choice right not a uh not a fiscal choice about how you're 
um, moving those federal dollars. So I think that um, I think that we are missing Joe Biden's voice in Texas right now. And I would like to see uh, the president and vice president down there and talking about what a travesty this is. People are, um, you know, going through hell right now. And um, we and and the best that we can do, because we've been thinking about this as a union, too. How do we help people? We can't even get in there. How, right. how can we even get help to people? Um, the best we're going to be able to do is to integrate or to interface with the companies and say, listen, you've got to you can't expect people to come right back to work. They've got busted pipes. They've got all kinds of ancillary problems that are going to mm-hmm. happen because of this, even when the temperature goes back up. Right. And right. things can get back to normal. Um, so we got to at the very least, the people who are dying right now, the people who are freezing right now, the people who are terrified that they're not able to properly take care of their kids right now. We have to at least take this moment to define why this was a problem and say That's never right. fucking again. That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. Because it's so Ayanna Presley, Ayanna Presley introduced a resolution yesterday for a jobs guarantee, a federal yes. jobs guarantee. And this is something that the country needs to look at and talk about, um, because this is also about getting at equity and finishing the work of the civil rights movement and right. also the um, uh, the economic New Deal that FDR proposed. And um, and we can get away from this cruel idea that we're going to build a an economy around the fact that you know, 5% of the population at any given time who wants to work is just pushed out of work. So I hope people will take a look at that and start talking about it. This is, this is a really, uh, it's historic that Ayanna Presley was the one to introduce this. And we all need to be talking about how we build a better economy. And back to your other point, you know, that's related to how we're going to uh, build a green economy. And you said doesn't necessarily interface with 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 my work. Well, you know, the first thing people say is put all the airplanes on the ground. So um, my members are very aware of the Green New Deal, but we were also the first ones to endorse it. Mm. And someone asked me, why did we do that? And I said, well, because we read it. (laughs) <laughs> because it takes into first of all it's a resolution right it's not legislation yes, it's right. so the, it's 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 an opportunity for us to talk about the kind of economy that we want to build a green economy um with true transition for workers right to make sure that people are shored up the people who are sort of transitioning out of the work that they're doing now find shore them up into retirement the others um, shore them up, keep them in the same salary that they've had and provide that retraining and also a job. That jobs guarantee is a key uh, component to this. And, and that's why people are opposed because they're terrified because any other right. environmental action that's been taken in the past has been about just moving the jobs out. And then the corporations still profit from it, but the people are left in a wasteland. Exactly. And so that's been the experience of the union members so far. And that's why people are opposed to it. So um, we have to show people that we're serious about building a different economy that's actually focused on workers first. Sarah Nelson, always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being um, candid, which is not always easy, <laughs> I, given so many dynamics. And um, we'll just keep, you know, keep it up and we'll keep watching you. Hope Thanks, you Mickey. And, soon. you know, keep pushing them out there. I love it. I'm not. <laughs> Ignore the trolls. <laughs> I was like, e- if, if Ron Klain reads this tweet, that's all I care about. I don't care. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So send this link to Ron Klain, everybody, okay? <laughs> Good plan. Good plan. Right. And he's in receive mode. I, I, I truly love this guy. So anyway, all right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. Take care. Take care. Bye. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break with our lovely panel for Fun Friday.
Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. So Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer-owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm to your door, their farm in Vermont. Sunset Lake CBD has something for everybody. Uh, They offer tinctures, which we know Sam Cedar loves, Uh, gummies, which Dorsey, our producer, talked about last week loving, as well as my parents who stole my container of gummies over the holidays and ate them all uh, and enjoyed them and said that it helped them sleep. Solves, which I use every night uh, to help me go to sleep a little bit. I'll put it under my nose. It's like a really nice smell. And coffee, coffee, CBD coffee. So like you don't get that crazy high when you drink coffee. It calms you down and it helps with stress, aches, and pains. Uh, It was originally a dairy farm from the Ben and Jerry's dairy farm of Vermont. So could you imagine something with better juju and more progressive politics? I think not. Uh, But they decided to diversify and grow premium hemp there. Customers support sustainable agriculture that enhances rural economies, so important right now, and creates meaningful employment for the community. Their minimum wage is, what a shock, $15 an hour, way to be ahead of the curve. Uh, Employees own the majority of the company and they support independent media like our show, like the Majority Report, and like the David Packman show. Uh, I love their products. I tried them out. They sent me a big batch. Um, I've been I've been using their gummies regularly, probably a little bit too much. My family uses them, as I said. Uh, the, the tincture helps you go to sleep at night. I have major, major, major insomnia, so much so that I have this device that monitors my sleep. And every single night, I look at the app, and it can tell me, how much time I was awake, how much time I had deep sleep, and how much of it was light sleep. And since I've been chewing those gummies, and since I've used that tincture, my sleep has been deeper. I, I'm not waking up in the middle of the night. Uh, it really is actually making a difference. And then I'm not addicted to sleeping pills, which is just never good. Uh, so I fully endorse this product. Go check it out. You can use the promo code NOMI, N-O-M-I, for 20% off your entire order at sunsetlakecbd.com. All right. It is Femme Friday. We are super, super, super excited to have reoccurring guests who we love. Uh, Simone Baptiste, she's the director of $16,000. It was her directorial debut. Uh, It's about a struggling Black college grad who wakes up to find that reparations have finally been paid to descendants of enslaved people in America. Go check it out. Uh, And Hadass Thier is here. She is the author of A People's Guide to Capitalism, an Introduction to Marxist Economics. She's also a regular contributor to Jacobin and a member of DSA in Brooklyn. Hello, hello. Welcome back, ladies. Hey. Thank you. Thanks. Hope y'all are warm. This uh, (laughs) lovely time that we're living in of climate change. Um, So we just had Sarah Nelson on, uh, the leader of the flight attendants workers, and she is you know, she's, in my opinion, uh, one of the most powerful labor leaders in the country, and she's been pushing the Biden administration to go further and further. Uh, but I want to start out with with something that I know she's talked about quite a bit, which is how women have been hit hard, uh, the hardest with this COVID economic crisis to the point where, like, the numbers are are are, are not surprising, but jarring. And I just feel like the conversation is not, it's about the economy collapsing, unemployment numbers, Wall Street bouncing back, but very little is about just the cost of, to frontline workers at unions like majority uh, female made up of unions like Sarah Nelson's union, the flight attendants workers, or nurses, or teachers. These are all unions that have been on the front lines, majority female. And then obviously the other uh, effects of the economy. I had asked, you know, you write on this stuff a lot. How, what do you think that we need to do? I know this is a big question to kind of shift the perception around the economy and women, like linking them together a little bit more. So Joe Biden realizes he's a better feminist, say, when he supports working people. Right. Absolutely. I mean, there's, so there's a few problems, right? One is that the industries that have been hit hardest, um, you know, restaurants, hospitality are overwhelmingly women. Um, and there's also the case that because women already make less than men and because women generally are saddled with more of the household responsibilities, um, you know, that if there's an option, if there's a family with a mom and a dad and there's a lack of childcare, uh, even if they had the option of who it was that had to leave their job, um, it's going to be generally the mom that, that does it. So, um, so there's a few layers of problems there. Um, and, you know, the, the main issue is that 
there needs to be a much, much more aggressive economic relief. You know, we're debating out here, you know, a few billion dollars there, a few billion dollars here, but the problem is so much deeper. Uh, instead of laying off, you know, hundreds of thousands of restaurant workers and hotel workers, et cetera, you know, you keep them on the, you know, on the employment rolls and you pay their wages uh, until the business can go back online. And I think, you know, that isn't even really being discussed. We're talking about, are we sending, are we going to send people $1,400 or $2,000 as a one-off check that is right. so completely, um, you know, insufficient. Uh, and, and there's a, and there's a, also a, uh, the problem of childcare, you know, of actually having uh, real public universal affordable childcare um, so that it's not a matter of, do you either force teachers back to work in unsafe conditions or do you leave parents without any help um, that we, we actually need to have um, a much better social safety net in place? Obviously, that's not going to happen overnight, but that that's the, the long term vision of the, of the kind of things that we need to be pushing for. And if we're starting at this point, I mean, Simone, uh, Hadass brings up a great, great point. Like, it's like the entire conversation is is around pennies. It's about just Nothing. I mean, nothing that's going to get us out of this crisis, nothing that's going to band-aid this crisis, and definitely not something that's going to prevent the future crises from happening. I know you've worked a lot around reparations. I mean, this is no greater tale of how if you don't deal with people when they need the it can have residual long-term institutional effects. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's like America got reparations and it was also like not sufficient. It was just a check and it was only one time. And why is this happening? (laughs) But I think that, um, you know, it just goes to show um, how America has really just declined. Um, We're not like a superpower that's like leading the charge on, um, you know, an equitable distribution of uh, resources and economic relief to um, our people in this country where we are seeing other countries who are able to go above and beyond to um, supply for their their own people because, you know, outside of just this pandemic, um, other countries were far ahead of us and just making sure that they were starting to implement universal programs and, um, you know, making sure that, you know, their health crisis wasn't going to be, um, you know, com- um, compacted, I guess, onto another health crisis. So they had kind of already taken steps in that direction um, to have an equitable access to health care. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas here in the United States, we were very far behind. So of course, with the pandemic, um, you know, we were never going to be able to uh, tackle this appropriately. So I think it's just you know, we, yeah, we are fight, fighting for pennies. You're right, Nomiki. It's really sad um, that we are at this point and we're almost a year into this and um, and we have not seen anyone step up to make sure that the American people are taken care of. Um, you know, Ezra Klein uh, wrote in the New York Times, and I'm glad you brought that up, Hadass. Uh, he wrote for the New York Times that it isn't so bad if some parents leave work because a, children's, a child care allowance enables them to do so. I don't know if you guys saw that piece. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if first off, it's uh, nothing against Ezra Klein, but I would have preferred to see a woman write this article because of of many other costs that have we've now seen, at least in some formal um, data, uh, there has been like an ex- an exceeding cost on women um, being at home, working simultaneously, bearing the brunt of childcare and cleaning and doing all the other stuff that you never get paid for that gender wise tends to be, happen more with women. Um, I feel like we're just uh, in, a, in a place where we're, we're, we're the conversation's just like, like in a different ecosystem. If this is the transformative progressive conversation in the New York Times right now, uh, we're never going to be at a good point. But I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned, Simone, um, other countries, because you know, there's this big debate about how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for healthcare? How are we going to pay for uh, wiping away student debt, $10,000, $50,000, whatever it is. How are we going to pay, you know, how our business is going to be pay for a $15 minimum wage in five years? Um, yet, the EU is doing so much better economically, c- comparably, in this crisis because they had that safety net. And if you're living crisis to crisis, we, we know this as humans who live on this planet, that like, 
when a crisis hits, the more you have in your, you know, saved, the better you bear in that crisis. I mean, I don't, I, I, you guys can't predict much, but like what, how can we as as progressives through DSA or whatever, how can we help shift this conversation in, at a more rapid pace other than just electorally? Are there ways, um, you know, maybe it's community aid, maybe we should be putting pressure for Biden to go down and this is the moment for the Green New Deal given uh, Houston. I'm going to open that up. Anybody can chime in. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, you know, the whole question of how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? Like we need to just put that, to rest. You know, I mean, it's especially now where we've seen this past year, they literally have been pouring trillions of dollars into the financial markets, right? Yep. I mean, Congress has been having these debates, you know, all year long um, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve, with zero accountability, nobody who's voted for, zero transparency, is just pouring trillions of dollars yep. into uh, the financial markets. So, uh, because, you know, that's the economy that they know how to prop up. Right. Um, whereas taking care of regular people is just not on the agenda. Um, and neither is, you know, a proper vaccine plan, which would actually do, go a long way towards, um, you know, re- reviving the economy when, pe- when it's safe, when it's actually safe to go back to work. Um, but anyway, so I think that that's one thing to say is that, you know, the whole question of how we're going to pay for it just has to be put to rest once and for all. Um, the other thing is that, you know, um, I, I think there's a lot of different campaigns that are going on. I mean, we have the benefit right now of, you know, the Democrats do control, you know, the, both the executive and the legislative houses. We have Bernie Sanders as the head of, uh, you know, budget finance in, um, in, in Congress. Um, we have a lot of conservative Democrats, but we, we don't have the excuse anymore of nothing can be done. And so there's an opening right now, I think, for people on the left to really push hard. You know, Biden has said that the next up after passing the stimulus bill will be an infrastructure plan. And so that's our chance to go in hard about what kind of mm-hmm. infrastructure Uh, how big do we need to go and how green do we need to go? Right. Um, And, and then there's, you know, local uh, campaigns as well that we need to be involved in. I I'm here in New York city and um, the DSA uh, both on the ground and also in terms of the legislators that are now in office, because we have six uh, democratic socialists in, in Albany right now are pushing for a tax to rich um, campaign, a suite of six bills, um, which will, drastically change the, you know, uh, can I, can I do the pushback? And I know you have an answer for this and understand, but they're all going to move to some, like they're going to move to Texas. They're just going to take their money somewhere else. They're going to take it to the Cayman islands or, or, you know, wherever it's Florida, obviously that's where everybody goes. So then what? Right. Well, factually, it's just not true. So I, I don't, I don't have, um, I could pull up the numbers. Um, but DSA has these, um, graphs that they've been using to show how as, taxes go up, there's zero correlation between right. that and um, the rich um, leaving. So um, so it just doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, I I'll think- I'll throw one more out there. Yeah. Tax real estate, like enough with these tax abatement schemes. I mean, there's so much money that could be put into infrastructure um, that we could also, and that's kind of what holds up so many other people, but tax rich and real estate, I'll just throw that out. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one of the problems is, is that the only, um, you know, wealth tax that exists in New York, and I don't know what it's like in, in other states, but in, in New York, the only wealth tax form of a wealth tax that, that exists is a property tax. But as you get richer, you diversify your wealth more and more. And so really, it ends up being disproportionately a tax on the middle class, because there's like small homeowners and stuff like that. Whereas the richer you get, the more, you know, your, your, um, your wealth lies in many different places, most of which are completely untaxed. Um, So there needs to be, you know, really taxes that target the rich, um, much. I meant the developers. I didn't mean into individual real estate people. Um, Simone, what's, what's your take on this? Yeah. I mean, going back to what people in DSA can do, I mean, 
having an intersectional analysis, tying all these different fights together only strengthens your argument. So I could see California getting a Medicare for all and then that being replicated across the country. Like, I think that we shouldn't discount um, state level fights for Medicare for all, um, but also understanding the, you know, the disparities that affect different communities of color for healthcare and how that's also, you know, um, eventually tied to um, the climate justice fight as well and the disparities that exist uh, in that fight as well. Um, and I think the more um, that we make it clear that all these are woven together and interconnected and we will not be liberated without, you know, making sure that we have an equitable society, then yeah, I think overall we have to just start tying these fights together. We cannot rely solely on electing progressives. Um, you know, we're dealing with um, a struggle in LA right now where we elected a progressive to our city council and first three votes were, you know, to fund police and public housing, um, to build a high rise that had 0 0.03 um, affordable units and uh, to have an RV ban. Who is this? Nithya Rahman. So, we, you know, that's why I, I kind of say like, yeah, we can try to get people elected and hope for the best, um, but it doesn't always pan out. And so we have to definitely have another strategy to be able to get these, um, you know, these big universal ideas um, through, you know. That happens in New York too. It's it's lovely. Um, you know, they're hu it's, it, it, it's, it's human nature. It's, it, very easy uh, when you have power to be influenced by power and politics is a is an interesting game. Um, so you just have to keep holding them accountable and making sure that they're more like them in there to hold them accountable as well. And so as I think that's what's amazing about New York, very rapidly uh, so many progressives were elected that are identified with being democratic socialists or are actually members of the DSA and they're able to make it the norm. So it's safer for other folks to come out now and, and disconnect themselves from certain interests. Um, I hate to do this. We're out of time for today. I'm really sad because I like to go over on these panels, but today I can't. Uh, Hadas Thier, Simone, Bacti De yeah, Simone Baptiste, uh, hope to have you back on very soon. We can have a, a deeper conversation about these issues, but always appreciate your time and joining us for Femme Friday. Thank you for Thank having you so me. much. Thank you guys. And to everybody else, thank you for joining us today on our, our we've had a couple of brief shows this week. So thank you to everybody for, for sticking around. Um, Kyler Asado sends us a lot of love. Thank you, Kyler. If Joe Biden wants to be a better feminist, he can pass a feminist economic recovery plan from Cara Jabola Carolas. That is a great idea. We should talk about that next week. Note to self. Dorsey, let's make sure to talk about that next week. I'll always beat this drum, but the feminist economic recovery originated in the U.S. and was adopted by several other countries, but not here like labor. R.I.N. says, focusing on the working class pleases progressives, gets by with centrist, and pacifies MAGA. Inter it's a different form of intersectionality, I guess. Pete from Oakland sending the love. Nomi Ki, how did you develop your skill for strategizing? Sometimes so your demands are so prescient. prescient. Uh, it seems like you're a psychic. I <laughs> hope this is enough to get you a snack with your coffee. Best to you. Thank you. Um, I read a lot uh, in the morning. I don't. I don't know. Sometimes I. You, you, you do this enough. You snuff. You could sniff things out in advance. And if you know the lawmakers and you know their tendencies, I don't know. Um, but we have had a couple of days where we do openings and then we demand something, and then another paper says it or another person says it. And uh, but it's also teamwork. This is an entire group that puts the show together, and it's not just me. So maybe we're all psychics. Maybe there's something in the ether. Kowalski for Nebraska says family friendly. Fa oh my, are you giving me a tongue twister? You guys are cruel. Family friendly, fantastically fabulous feminist Friday frenzy fighters force, frankly, facilitating, flipping, fascinating foresight, fracturing friction, fortresses for freedom, fire forecast forever. I've been media trained. <laughs> Craven James uh, says happy Fem Friday and happy 25th anniversary to Democracy Now! Agreed. I Thanks for that reminder. Uh, saying, oh, I just lost it. Any chance you can get Amy Goodman on for a future Fem Friday interview? Left is best. Great idea. We'll add that down there. Uh, MR Fancy Pants says, I love Sarah Nelson. I have been sharing the No Politician is Going to Save Us clip from her last appearance on the Nomi Key Show nonstop since it dropped. Thank you. You and Sarah make a good team. A panel with her, Zephyr McAlevey, would be lights out. Oh my gosh. Yes. That would be a dream. 
Um, I think I might be the only brunette in that plant panel. So <laughs> thank you to RBK who's in the chat, mixing it up on YouTube and Twitch and many doctors for working those algorithms. Huge, huge, huge. Thank you to our moderators, Bob Choken, Bob C, Choken, the Orb and Chuck Diesel and over on Twitch. Hey, everybody on Twitch. I promise I will p- play a game. I think when we hit hundred K, that's what I've agreed to do. Uh, I will be playing a game. We're going to put a promo up for that. I promise. It's been a crazy week. We'll make sure to do that. So to everybody on Twitch, make sure. Uh, and every, oh my God, what is this? Dory, Dorsey, what is this? What is this? <laughs> Dorian Sapiens, a difficult truth. Our means a nug wrangler. Thank you for keeping those live chats troll free and full of emo- emotes, right? They're not emojis, they're emotes. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm channeling my inner 16 year old my inner gamer. We will see you on Tuesday. In the meantime, stay in solidarity. Take care.